Mai ka piina kala i hae hae ai ka mole olu ole hoa i kai o kana loa. Belina mai e na kupa o Hawaii i hoa uli. Welcome everyone to Kanayo Kana Talks. For kumu, by kumu. Mahalo nui for joining us for our fifth and final session on Pedagogy of Aloha. Pedagogy of Aloha Online, how to make online learning fun. In this webinar, we will hear from my mother, Dr. Kuka Hakalao, on how to make online learning fun and exciting. Belina, o polani makamai ka oako kalani ka hakalao ko inoa. Before we get started, we would like to do an opening protocol. Our opening protocol for today is Aloha Eie, a greeting chat. Please join along. Aloha Eie, Aloha e na Akua, Aloha e na Umakua, Aloha e na Liu Hawaii. Aloha e na kūpuna, aloha e na mākua, aloha e kale hulehu, aloha e ie. Aloha. Aloha mai kāko, o kū hina hina kū i kaha kai kaha kalau ko u inoa, a o ke ia kū u mau mu opuna. O Honolulu ku'u oneha nao, o Makua ku'u kai. O Hawaii ku'u mokupuni, o Ka'u ku'u moku, o Kilauea ku'u lua pele, a o Waipio ku'u awawa. Aloha mai kākou. Mama, would you mind sharing us a little bit about yourself before we get started on Pedagogy of Aloha? Yes, um, so I've been an educator since 1985, probably before most of you folks were born. And I've worked primarily with Hawaiian students over those years, trying to really figure out how Hawaiians learn best today in the 21st century. Um, what I found out really was that by using the ways of our kupuna, the way they educated, um, we get the, most, the best results. And this is not just for Hawaiians, but really for everybody. And so what we found out was that uh, aloha, you know, this, this beautiful, beautiful value of uh, taking care of one another and um, cherishing one another and uh, making each other feel comfortable and safe and loved is really the most important ingredient in education. And this is what the students told us over those past decades is that when they are in an atmosphere where they feel loved and cared for, then they can learn, then they can thrive, then they can excel. Um, what we also found out is that the, the ways of our kupuna, this ancient way of learning is also aligned with the latest in neuroscience, in educational paradigms that come out of Stanford and Harvard and Yale. Um, and so what is so fascinating is that when it comes to Hawaiian education, ancient is modern. Just so that we all have a common foundation, can you please summarize one last time, um, Pedagogy of Aloha? So as I mentioned, this Pedagogy of Aloha evolved as a result of the, the input that our students gave in terms of what is the most important ingredient in, in Hawaiian contemporary education, and it's clearly aloha. And then when we looked at, you know, what does it really look like, we realized that it's really based on a simple formula that says relations first. So the most important part as you begin your new school year now, if you're a teacher, is to build relations building relations between you and the students, among the students themselves, um, you and the families of your students, the students and the environment, and if possible, the students and the spiritual world. So building those relations first. And sometimes that may take a whole month 
to build strong relations. But it is a time that's well worth it because once you have those strong relations, then the rest of the school year will move smoothly. The second part then is that whatever you are teaching has to be relevant to the lives of the students. It has to make sense to the students. It has to be things that the students can at least initially um, hook into based on their own experiences. And then from there you go out in concentric circles. The third part is that as you're teaching them, it should never be teaching for teaching sake or learning for learning sake. It should be always linked to Kuleana, meaning whatever the students learn, they have to understand their responsibility to use that learning. And when you follow those three things, relations first, then relevance, and then responsibility of Kuleana, your, your outcomes are automatically going to be rigorous. And with the rigorous part, it's going to be contemporary rigor, and traditional rigor. You know, I really don't like to say too much academic and cultural rigor because that kind of implies that cultural rigor is not academic. I like to say contemporary rigor because that's the rigor that they need to succeed as 21st century citizens, but that is based on traditional rigor, which is the values and the ways of life of our kupuna. And on top of that, if you're doing it right, you're supposed to have fun. Mahalo. So in today's webinar, we will talk about how to have fun. What are some tools that will strengthen students' online learning experiences and make online learning rigorous and fun? So um, before we get into the, the fun part, let's just, uh, I want to just uh, summarize one more time that relations is with the Kanaka, the Aina, and the Akua. The relevance is to place, to culture, to contemporary real world issues. So in this school year, if you're not talking about COVID, you're really missing something because that's a contemporary real world issue. And then also personal interests. As far as responsibility, it's responsibility to self, to ohana, to community, to lahui, and to our honua, to our world, uh, i.e. papaha naomoku. And then the rigor, as I mentioned, is contemporary sometimes also referred to as academic or global competence, competence traditional, um, also known as cultural or local or Hawaiian competence, and then also social and personal competence. Those are all outcomes of pedagogy of aloha. And then here we are now with our fun part. So fun through project-based learning, place-based learning, culture-based learning, and multi-age learning. Um, so, and we will talk about those a little bit more in a little while. But initially, uh, I would like to first share with you some of the tools that can be used in an online environment to make learning fun. And Albert Einstein said, you know, play is the highest form of research. So the more we can gamify our instructions online, the more we can allow our students to play, i.e. learn, the more fun they will have and the more they will learn. When we first started to implement Hawaiian focused education, we were accused of not teaching our students, not, not um, setting high enough standards or rigorous enough standards. And when we asked why, you know, why was this, why were people thinking that they said, because you folks are always laughing. Whenever we come by your classroom, we hear everybody having a good time and having fun. And so somewhere in, in our Western education, the concept that if students are laughing, if students are having fun, if they are playing, they're not learning. But nothing could be further from the truth, um, as um, you know, Albert Einstein reminds us. So here are some of the, um, the gamification of learning tools. So one of the things, to gamify your online classroom or your course or your unit is by just changing the language. You know, instead of saying, are oh, we having these objectives and this is your homework or this is your classwork or, you know, this is something that you have to do, you know, talk about 
or let's embark on a quest together to find out the solution for this or this thing. Or here is a mission that we need to complete either as individuals or as small groups or as large groups. Or here's a challenge. I want you, can you accept this challenge and go to it? So just using those kind of uh, language that is used in, 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 in gamification, that already changes the way students perceive learning. And then instead of you know, being stuck with our ABC, um, Ds, et cetera, that don't align with standards-based learning in the first place, um, see if you can, instead of uh, um, awarding grades, uh, let students have points that are connected, uh, experience points or XPs that are connected to badges or other virtual rewards and see how much more they're inclined to go for their points kind of a thing, then, you know, oh, I got an A or I got a B kind of a thing. And then the other part is that one of the important things to do also um, in our new online environment is modifying the structure of the learning environment. So instead of um, people working by themselves, create small teams where the students have to work together to complete a mission or to, uh, to embark on a quest together or expect, accept a specific um, challenge. Um, traditionally, um, if you were a classroom teacher like I was prior to COVID, um, we already did all kinds of games in the classroom, right? We, we sometimes we did crosswords or other kind of puzzles, jigsaws, whatever puzzles. We, we played bingo with our students. Um, either um, in person or online kind of. We had you know, opportunities for them to play matching games or hangman or charades or win or lose or draw. I used to use those a lot, for example, to test vocabulary um, or any kind of multiple choice games. So game, using games in the classroom is not necessarily a new thing, right? Um, and we can still use these kind of um, tools that are more that come out of the standard classroom um, also in an, an online environment. Um, I know um, Polani just created some bingo cards for, for one of our online classes where they then print out um, the, their, the, the bingo card and their individual um, little words and then we would play it online um, as far as calling out the the words that they have to try and get a bingo kind of thing. So you can still play these things also in an online um, classroom. But some of the other ones that are really effective that are specifically designed for online um, learning are, for example, Kahoot. Um, Kahoot is so much fun because the students play against one another and you, and you will know at the end who, who was the first place, the second place and the third place winner. Um, you can um, just do so many different things in terms of um, introducing the students to new materials, reviewing materials that you, material that you have already covered, testing that material instead of through a, a, a boring test. Why don't you have them play Kahoot and then using those scores um, or just uh, as a, as a, um, formative assessment kind of seeing how many people got what, what you were teaching them. Um, Quizlet Live is another um, one of those gamification tools. Maybe uh, Polani, would you mind uh, explaining a little bit how we use Quizlet Live with our Hawaiian language class, our online Hawaiian language class? Yes. So with the Quizlet Live, we um, simply created a Quizlet account where the Ohanas can access at any point in time to practice their vocabulary. We uh, use one of the um, their buttons, the buttons that Quizlet have that says Quizlet Live, and you simply click on that. And um, the first thing that will pop up will be the URL where the families need to go to. And then they just have to incorporate or add their names. And then, um, then we just wait for the rest of the families to join in. And then we press start. And that's how you do Quizlet Live. And again, the, the, the students love it because they're, they're challenging one another. And they have an opportunity to, uh, 
to demonstrate their knowledge or to practice the knowledge to exercise in this kind of a game game format. Class craft is is kind of similar uh, in uh, to some of the other craft <laughs> uh, programs where. Um, you have a, a, a challenge and a task and the students have to work together to get to, to a specific goal or to achieve a specific um, mission. Um, some of the other ones, clickers and poll everywhere, um, are used a lot just to kind of uh, understand where the students are and what they're thinking. And it's really easy for the teachers to use that data to then assign grades if they want to. But it, more of it is really, the, the more important part is really that students are having fun <coughs> while they have, while they're learning. Um, noisily, for example, um, incorporates sound. So if you're teaching something where, where sound is an important piece of it, um, noisily is a wonderful gamification tool. And you can look all of these up online and, and see, um, examples of them and see how they work in detail. Um, but these are just a few of the online gamification tools. Um, really, the easiest thing is to just Google that and, and see what other ones come up. And then if you see one that works for you, I would say try it out. So the thing with that is, you know, that as teachers, we were told somehow that we, that we always need to have our act together that we need to know exactly what we're doing and that everything in our classroom should run smoothly. But the truth of the matter is life doesn't work that way, right? If you're gonna innovate, if you're gonna do new things, you have to try them out. And when you, the whole part about trying, right, ho ao in Hawaiian is in order to ao, we have to cause something to happen to ao, which means that sometimes things will not turn out perfect and sometimes, some things will outright fail or don't work the way we thought they would work. And that's okay. I think that's a really important part that teachers need to recognize as they're gonna be working with new tools that they never heard of or that they've never um, used themselves growing up because you know, when I grew up, none of this existed, for example, is that we're open to that kind of insecurity, to that kind of, um, challenges where, where we really don't always know what the outcome is. And as a good teacher, we're okay to say, um, this is the first time I'm going to do that. I mean, I prepare to the best of my knowledge. I practiced it with my family, but I don't know if it's going to work with you folks now. So let's just all do our best, give it our best. And what, when, if it doesn't work, then we got to go back to the drawing board and figure out how to change it. Don't be afraid to put yourself into that position. I think that's probably one of the most important parts that I wanna emphasize as you're using some of these new online gamification tools that it will allow your students to have so much fun in the classroom. It's for you to be open, to be a risk taker, to be honest with your students. Yeah, don't pretend you know it if you don't know it. You know, um, uh, it's perfectly fine to say, you know, this is the first time that I'm using this with my students. Um, let's see how it goes. Uh, please tell me afterwards what you liked about it, what you didn't like about it. And then the ones that the students enjoy, keep using them, keep getting better at them because like everything else, the more often you use these tools, the better you will get to know them. And then the ones that just flop, they didn't work at all, you know, uh, if you have, a, if you know what the reason was, if it was a technical difficulty, that's one thing. But if it's just that this is not the right tool for your students, because that also depends on the audience, right? All of these tools are uh, better or not so good for specific audiences, then just don't use that anymore. But be creative and look out um, on, on, in the online environment uh, for new tools as they become available. As I mentioned, me, most of these gamification tools are, can be used for multiple purposes. They can be used to introduce new knowledge. They can be used to test existing knowledge, meaning um, what do the students bring with them when they first enter your classroom at the beginning of the school year? 
you know, they're going to be coming from different places, sometimes even from different schools, uh, using some of these gaming tools, gamification tools to test where your students are at and what knowledge they already bring with them is not just effective, but also lots of fun. Um, they can test information that you just presented either right, right at the end of the lesson or they can allow you to review information from the last class at the beginning of the next class. Um, you can use them to review information from multiple classes. That's one of the things, you know, with, with, the, with our current education system is we just teach something, we test it, and then that's it. You know, the students never hear of it again. Um, that's really not a good way <laughs> to teach because they don't, most times, don't retain what they studied for that one specific test. So by doing these reviews throughout the year where you're reviewing information from a, the past quarter or the past semester or even the entire year, you know, just, just bits and pieces of it um, is really important to help with, with retention, but also with, again, students having fun. Um, and so um, we believe that by using these gamification tools, you can do so many things that um, make learning so much more fun than just providing worksheets and exercises and, and tests. So let's get back to some of the more Hawaiian and culture-based ways of uh, teaching that also result in fun. And they are project-based learning, place-based learning, culture-based learning, multi-age learning. These are all traditional and contemporary ways that we can make learning more fun. Now, in our online environment, we're going to have to be a little bit more creative, but just because we're online doesn't mean we cannot do place-based, project-based, culture-based, or multi-age education. And we talked about that a little bit in the previous sessions already. So, I'd like to um, just share with you a few of the um, projects that we have been doing at Kanuoka Aina uh, at, during the first decade um, there from 2000 to 2010 approximately. And um, what the students did and then uh, Polani, because she was part of that, those groups there, um, she can then share a little bit about what, what parts of these projects she enjoyed. So one um, fun project, at least in my opinion, fun project was engaging the students in real world science. So this was a project that included students from fifth grade to 12th grade, um, sixth grade to 12th grade, but Polani was one who got in in fifth grade already. It was called the YP Awada study and it's focused was science, specifically stream biology. And it was actually a historic research study. So this was a, a research that was done with our partners, which was Bishop Museums, Bishop Museum, and also the, um, the, the state, uh, Uncle, can you help me a little bit there, <laughs> Polani? Um, who else did you folks work with? With the um, DLNR with Uncle John Kahiapo, um, where we did some water quality testing and looking at the different species that lived uh, specifically in the Mulivai, the estuary part of the streams. And um, we had the privilege of working with Bishop Museum scientists um, that took us to Hi'ilave and Lalakea, which is above Hi'ilave Falls, the same river, but. Um, once it becomes a falls, it's Hi'ilave, and then above that is Lalakea. So we tested the water quality, um, looked at the different species that lived in the stream, as well as um, the, the insects that live there. And we looked at the habitat and checked how it changed over time. Um, and all of these things were taught to us by uh, the professionals in their field. So like I said, the scientists at Fisher Museum, as well as Uncle John Kahiapo from DLNR. And so it was a, the, the, the essential question was basically, this was the first time that a, a diverted stream was 100% returned into its native stream bed. 
And so the idea was what would be the impact of such a 100% restoration. And so this really, uh, this project had statewide impact because if they could prove that natives thrive when the waters are restored again, then that would give, provide data for other communities that wanted their waters restored. So this took place in Waipio Valley, where um, the, the, the waters of Hi'ilawe and Hakalaoa Falls had been diverted um, by the sugar companies. <coughs> and so as um, Polani mentioned, they worked with the scientists in the field. They collected and analyzed real data, meaning this was data that is still available in the Bishop Museum, that's still available um, online uh, in their reports uh, that talk about the importance of stream restoration. They use high-tech equipment, and when well, we'll go to the next slide, you'll see some pictures, and maybe Polani can explain that. And as part of that, they explored various green careers. It was the first ever study, as I mentioned, me measuring the impact of 100% stream restoration of native stream ecology. It took place between 2003 and 2011. So it was a multi-year project. And Polani, for example, was in the YP water study from fifth grade to 12th grade, which meant that, that the students that were part of this study um, stay down in YPO every other week from Monday to Thursday um, and um, participated in this, um, in the research and in the da uh, gathering of data in multiple locations. As she mentioned, Lalakea and Hi'ilawe stream um, in YPO Valley. And so what, what the reason for this was to measure the impact of the restoration um, and measure the changes in water quantity, quality, and temperature. And part of this research integrated the latest technology, including digital data collection, web discussion forums, and this uh, dissemination of the data via the internet. So here are some pictures. Uh, Polani, can you talk a little bit about these pictures and, and with the idea of, um, was it fun? <laughs> yes. So. Um... All of these pictures are taken in various uh, parts of YPO Valley as well as above YPO Valley. Um, on, I'm not sure if my right or left is going to be the same as the viewers, but on my top left hand side is measuring the water quality. So what that means is that we are checking the dissolved oxygen, if there's enough oxygen in the water, the turbidity, um, how much dirt is moved within um, the stream, the pH level, um, the conductivity, and the, oh, there's one, and the temperature, I don't think I said temperature, but the temperature of the water. So we use this, um, uh, we use this instrument called the hydro lab that measures these different water qualities. And on the bottom right side is my beautiful sister, Iini, looking um, at the hydro lab and uh, reading the numbers and someone holds the other end the probe to that collects all the data. Um, on my bottom left is um, a velocity rod and meter and um, the kumu and the haumana are looking at the velocity of the water. So we check the surface, the mean, which is the middle and the bottom to see if there's a difference over time um, from when we first started collecting the data in 2003 all the way in to 2011 and um, we always measure at the same spot every time we go down so we'll set a marker um, with a type of um, tape that we just put onto a tree and every other week when we would go down to collect data from 2003 till 2011 we always went to that same spot so we could indicate whether or not the velocity changed over time um, at the bottom middle they are checked, they're mapping out the, the estuary, the Muliwai down in Waipio. And we all know that the Muliwai constantly changes. It all very, depends on the water flow that comes through, whether we have big rain, small rain, that that particular area is constantly changing. So that's good for us to know, um, to know whether or not a big flood came through or if there wasn't that much water that came through the valley. The picture right above the, the bottom is us um, collecting any type of uh, fishes using a seine net. So we would go um, use a seine net and just 
go like this every time so far up the stream and what we would do that would kind of bring all the fishes in and we would get gather um, the scoop nets and just scoop up whatever fishes were there and from there um, a lot of times we did catch opo as well as mollies and we would uh, measure them to see how big they they are getting and um, for the oopus we would regurgitate them to see what their diet was and what they were eating and many of them would eat the um, mollies so it's just for us to uh, get an idea of their their diet and um, for us to understand the, the life of the oopu as well as the molly um, on the right top is actually the diversion up at Lala Kea and um, everything that we would do down below in Hi'ilave, besides the things that we would do in the Muliwai, we did it all above at Alalakia as well. So we could see the difference because there is a difference in water quality with elevation. Um, so it was for us to learn and um, as, as Haumana to learn the difference between elevation and for us to just collect the data to see if anything has changed over time from 2003 to 2011. And at the very bottom right hand is a student um, observing the habitat in Hi'ilave stream. Um, he does have a ruler in his hand so I'm assuming that he was measuring out the rocks or if not if he saw any type of fishes he would try to get the measurement um, of that as well. So this is just some of the uh, data collection that we did do in the valley. Um, I found all of this different type of data collection to be very fun. I love collecting data. Um, I really feel that it prepared me for um, my, for my, for me going into college. Um, I took a few uh, courses in botany and then as well as in archaeology internships and it made me thrive in those portions where we had to collect data. So um, a lot of the students always looked forward to getting to this point where we had to go in the stream and we would actually, um, it would get really really deep at some places up at Lala Kea and we would go for it because you would have to dive all the way down to check the substrate which is the different rock sizes and it would be so deep and then the rest of the day we would just be so pulu, so wet but it was worth it, anything to just dive into that water. Uh, but yeah, that was, um, I really enjoyed this project and it, it's, a, it's, I'm a little bit sad that it didn't continue on because I know Haumana would really, really enjoy um, this type of education. And so even though now, you know, we, we are, um, you know, doing things online, that doesn't mean that we cannot have our students going out and, right. and collecting data in the environment, you know. Um, we can have them going to the beach and just observing, you know, um, um, the rocks that are there and the movement of those rocks, you know, many beaches don't stay the same from, from throughout the seasons, you know, and for them to observe those kind of things, to measure the, the, the rocks and just get used to collecting data. Because like Polani said, once students understand the importance of collecting accurate data, and recording that data and then analyzing that data, those skills can get transferred to any other data uh, collecting situation. So any other scientific data collection. Um, on the bottom right, uh, what, 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 what is that paper? Or what, what does he have there in, besides the ruler? It's most likely waterproof paper um, that was provided to us by the Bishop Museum or it could be a little baggy <laughs> to collect the samples, whatever it may be, like um, any type of algae or um, substrate that may be in the water as well. Um, but it's definitely a ruler or he may have another instrument that can determine the length of whatever um, he is looking at in the stream. Mahalo. And so if you want to know more about this, this particular study, you can go to the Bishop Museum website and it'll, it'll have a whole bunch of things on curriculum and just also pictures of the students in the stream having fun, but also learning. Um, when we first started this project, you know, people said, you know, 50% in the environment, you know, how are they going to be ready for college? Um, Polani, how would you answer that, that question? I was ready. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, this, like, like I made mention before, a lot of the 
the things taught to me with collecting data helped me with courses as well as internships um, in college. Um, I know for a fact that if I had to sit down in a classroom and read about it, I would lose interest and most likely fail in, in the class. Um, but actually doing hands-on learning and remembering these things too. Um, for example, in our botany class, we had to um, measure out the, the width of the, the different trees or the, the, um, the length as well, doing mapping. So this, this type of gathering um, data for this botany class was the same thing, but in a different environment that we did in the stream by stream mapping. So doing tree mapping and stream mapping, it was very similar and I was able to adapt very well um, the Kumu really enjoyed having me because I would be so excited. I'll be like, I would like to do the next transect, you know, pick me, you know, I'm going to, we have to let everybody um, take on that Koleana because everyone has to learn. But it just, it, with having the YPO water study, it really made, it, it motivated me to want to do um, scientific like data collection kind of things. And um, even now, you know, out of college as a mother right now, I want to go and collect data, just talking about it so much, but it, it does help the Haumana. And I can say that um, for others that even though they haven't been involved in the projects in 2011, things will just pop back into their mind like that because we did it so much. It was a repetition of collecting this data without getting bored at any point because we knew the importance of this project and the data collected would be for the future generations and for other projects that would come from this particular project. So we always stayed focused, always knew what we were doing because like I said, we knew the importance of it. Um, and then you also spent time in YPO learning from and in YPO from the place. So place-based learning is still something that we can also do uh, where the students really study a particular vahipana, a particular place. In this case, it was that the focus was more on the social studies aspect. And here's one of the signs that the students created um, that you can see when you go to the YPO lookout, there's five signs there and they tell about the history. And so as part of these, the, this research, you know, they went to Bishop Museum and they picked pictures that would um, depict that specific era that the sign was about. And then um, each sign is in Olelo Hawaii and then in Olelo Haole, so they would learn um, uh, some of language skills. So it was really um, interdisciplinary, but the primary focus being social studies. And so the idea was to bring, have staff or kupuna or community experts as resources, but really the environment being the primary text, the primary inspiration, and the students being involved in real world learning. And again, real research with the students being co-researchers. So that didn't only apply to the water study, but also to um, other research as it related to tarot, for example. Um, can you talk a little bit about this slide and the things that you learned about YPO while you were there? Yes. So as uh, my mother had mentioned that um, every other week we would go down to YPO Valley to either collect data for the, um, for the Bishop Museum or to um, learn about the history of white people. So we would have science weeks and culture weeks or do an integration of the two. Um, while we were down in the valley, um, we would learn mo'olelos of, of white people. So for example, umiali loa, puapua lena lena, nanawe. Um, and uh, we would also uh, have to have to learn olelo no eals that are um, of white people and learn the place names. And, you know, um, we were taught like Ahupua'as within Ahupua'as, there's Ilis within Ilis, there's more and more and more. And YPO is a, is a wonderful example of um, the land division within an Ahupua'a system. And to still have these Inoas is, is phenomenal, you know, that the Ohana still down there teach the next generations. And we had the opportunity of learning these Inoas. So for example, where um, our facility was located, we were in the Ili of Mokuwai. And when you look at Mokuwai um, from, from a bird's view, it really looks like a moku that is surrounded by vai, which makes sense, our kupuna, akamai. Um, other um, ilis that we have 
is Punaka, another one is Pueo, another one is Ka'au. So um, we were fortunate to learn to learn these Inuas, not only from our Kumu, my, my father, but our uh, Kupuna that were in the valley as well. Um, we learned many, many chants and songs, a lot of um, chants my uh, mama um, created from the knowledge that we learned. So that was really nice to have um, whatever we were taught be put into some kind of mele or oli and for us to perform at the end of the year. And also for us to just really um, be one and understand our natural environment. And so we would know the wind, the rain. We knew exactly when the rain was coming. You would see like, because we had our clothes line. So as soon as we saw the rain on the pali coming in, we started running to grab our clothes off the line because we knew we were so well connected to our environment that we just knew or even a shift in the wind. We knew exactly what was going to happen. So um, that came with um, over, over time and over years, we, we became one with white people. And I can speak for everyone who was a part of the project that they were connected with YPO, even though um, they did not come from that place. With going there every other week for so many years, they felt that they had finally become a part of YPO. And would you say that you well, folks had fun while you were doing all of that? Oh, yeah. So much fun. So much um, fun. And we, we actually became siblings, you know, having to be down there every other week, um, having to work side by side in the lo'i, having to um, work in the mala together as well, have pakanas or partners, having to rebuild the panivai, you know, all these kinds of things. You you gain relationships and it's it's fun. Fun doing all these um, cultural, cultural meas and being with um, people who soon became ohana, you know, your hoas to ohana was something um, fabulous. So it was definitely fun whether we were down there for science or for our culture weeks. Okay. Um, another uh, activity, uh, annual activity or, or, or um, focus was our makahiki. And so that was really the idea of practicing Hawaiian culture and traditions. And that is also something that we can continue to do in an online uh, environment. Specifically for us, uh, makahiki involves PE and health, social studies and Hawaiian studies. And um, here you see some of the traditional sports. So every year um, the students um, have a makahiki at Kanu. And then there's a, a makahiki for Hawaii Island. And the ones who excel in the makahiki um, at Kanu also get to go to the makahiki on Molokai. Um, Polani, tell us a little bit about your makahiki experiences, um, how you went from one to the next to the next. Kind of. I've been um, a part of makahiki for so long. Um, haven't been involved so much these days, but from a young age, uh, whether it was um, competing in the games as well as doing ceremonies, um, I've just been very involved in makahiki. So um, like my mama explained that we would have makahiki at our own school. So we would compete in numerous games. Um, it kind of goes by, by grade level. So certain grade levels can only do so much games and it's more of the games of strength because we don't want the bevis getting hurt from anything. So the, the older you are, the more games you have to compete in. And um, so I would, everyone gravitates to a certain game or has, um, has a bigger desire to do certain games. Um, I'm a more game of strength than skill. Don't really have too much skill, uh, but that's okay. I'm still learning. One day I'll be able to throw an Oh, oh, eh, eh. Um, one day, one day, but I'm a, I, I really enjoyed games of strength. And um, I've had the privilege of winning at our makahiki, our school makahiki, as well as our island makahiki, and making my way to Molokai to compete there. I've had the honor of um, being the Anokoa Kie Kie two years in a row in Molokai. So that was um, a huge honor to bring, bring home that title. Uh, to um, not only my school in my island, but my ohana as well. It's very competitive. It's hard, but you just have to maintain that the spirit of aloha to aloha your um, your opponents no matter what, and to just even though you want to just get in there and win, win, win. You you have to do it um, 
with humility and everything. So it, it taught me a lot um, to not just be all aggressive, but to to be humble um, with games of strength and also and also 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 to center myself um, by doing the ceremony. So it, it's it's to have that duality of practicing our um, traditional ceremonies as well as being an athlete. Can you talk a little bit more about the ceremonies? Yes. So for Kanuokaina, in order to go to Molokai, you actually have to participate in our um, ceremonies. So we always have two ceremonies, one in the ukas and one at Kai. Um, the ceremony is most times a sleepover, so we can all kind of get into that, that space and that mind of knowing what we have the very next morning. Um, during the evening times, we prepare ourselves. We go over what types of chants that we will be doing for the ceremony, as well as um, um, dividing out the kuleana per person. Most times, um, the individual in a haumana will do the same kuleana every year, but sometimes somebody else may want to awamo that or take on that responsibility. So we always try to make sure that each haumana has an opportunity to have um, kuleana, what I mean by kuleana is, uh, for example, being a kia'i. So holding um, two types of la'au that just kind of um, block the way of us providing that type of ho'okupu. Or um, being the individual that carries the, um, the, the, the pola with the vai that needs to be copied to bless our area. So um, that's that's always been the, the kanes kuleana, um, to be in that, that ceremonial space where they put on that ho'okupu and, um, and just be in that, the, where the ho'okupu is given in the, the places um, noad. And then the vahine, we will always be on the, just fairly outside of that place, um, just doing our olis and pulis and providing ho'okupu. Um, we've had uh, haumana participate in both Uka and Kai and both um, actually at our schools one, at our Aile Makahi as well as our Molokai Makahiki. Um, but we, we are always taught that that's the first thing that we need to do is always do our traditional ceremonies. We always need to center ourselves and make sure that we're pono and to give to the gods um, so they, they um, can help us and encourage us with the games and festivities that are going to happen fairly after. Mahalo. And then at the end of the year, every year we end the year with the ho'ike. And the ho'ike is to peers, it's to family, and it's to community, and it's a multi-age ho'ike where the kinder, the students from preschool actually all the way to 12th grade are involved in an hula drama uh, where we focus on performing arts, on cultural arts, on Hawaiian language, on, on language arts, and so much more. So, um, Polani, if you can just talk a little bit about um, the, the hula drama um, and, and, and what that was all about. Yes, so I've been involved in hula drama for many years. Um, basically, hula drama is an exhibition of our knowledge learned throughout the entire school year. And for every um, hui or grade level, it, it varies. Um, so, when we're in elementary, we would, for example, do some olis that have to do with some of the huakais we went on or um, uh, travels that we went on. We did some olis that and hula that had to um, that were affiliated with different uh, chiefs or place names. Um, in Waipio, uh, we did a lot of our hula and oli based on Waipio. And um, it was with um, all these based about white people that we we learn things that we learn or places that we went to, and we it was a, a collective um, kind of thing where we all decided what the air would be of an oli or what certain motions we would do for our hula. So it wouldn't just be one individual, but we would make sure it was a collaborative effort to put on this exhibition of knowledge learned. Okay, what about the attire? Where did you buy your attire? The attire came from Discount Fabric Warehouse. You can, or you can buy them online. Um, we've been very fortunate to um, utilize the same attire every year or um, buy some new ones. And actually the, um, the Haumana, we were involved with um, creating the attire, the look from 
from the look, from the sewing, from the dyeing, all these different um, aspects, we, we were involved and that was such an important part um, for us to use our hands, you know, to wear something that we created was just awesome. It was fun um, being able to, to create these, these types of um, attire and hula and oli and even our kupees, you know, our adornments, our lepoos, we, we created everything ourselves and it really um, helps with the students' motivation to want to do these things and to feel the need to not only help ourselves, but to help the babies as well, you know, getting dressed in their models. We've had so many boys, volunteers, like, hey, we'll help the babies get ready. So um, it, it taught us um, to to not only take care of ourselves, but to take care of everyone uh, we are surrounded by. Okay. And so um, one of the Olelo no Iau that I've always loved is Aai ka hula, vaiho ka hila, hila i ka hale. So when one wants to dance hula, bashfulness should be left at home. So when it's really time to perform, right? And the, this hula drama gave you folks an opportunity to kind of share with others what you've learned throughout the year, you know, based on the theme that was selected for that year and really dance your hearts out and have fun while you're doing it. And so um, these are the kind of projects, um, you know, that from, from the project-based learning in YPO to the culturally driven aspects of, you know, focusing on our Vahipana and learning about those places um, to engaging in, in sports and games and challenging one another. There's that challenge again that we talked about right at the beginning, right? So just, um, you, you can say, well, let's do PE and everybody will go, oh, or not everybody, but certain kids will say, ah, I don't want to do PE. But when, when you say, let's play some games, you know, then in general, everybody is into it because it's, it's a different thing. And when you, when you get to challenge students from other schools, et cetera, there is this, 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 this gamification also within, within that kind of a work. So even though, as I said, this school year, many of you will be doing at least partially online teaching, we can still incorporate some of these things into our online teaching. We can still have fun while we're doing online teaching by involving the students in authentic, in real world experiences. And I think, you know, having heard from Polani who graduated, I don't remember how many years ago did you graduate? From In 2013. Country? Okay, so, so seven years ago and still remembering in detail, you know, what she learned um, and and she she can tell you much, much more than what she just shared in this little time really speaks to the part that when education is fun, that it, when it is hands-on, when it is in the environment, when it is culturally driven, then the retention rate is just so much greater. And the way that the students remember their education is so much more positive. You know, when I look back at my high school, well, all the way kindergarten, all the way through high school experiences, I really don't remember having too much fun. I don't really remember having too many positive experiences that had to do with learning. You know, I had fun outside of the classroom, clearly before and after school and during recess, no doubt about it. But actually uh, uh, equating learning with having fun, I can't say that that was my experience um, going to school. But I think for many um, that are coming through these Hawaiian culture-based, Hawaiian-focused, Hawaiian immersion schools, um, or just classrooms where Hawaiian culture is an important part, where pedagogy of aloha is practiced and everybody feels safe and cared for, it. you know, their um, relation and their memories of education in the future will be so much more positive and will be so much more um, enjoyable I think and so that that's really an important part that I want to make sure that everybody really understands is that having fun from a Hawaiian perspective means that that students will learn because when they have fun they will learn and so um, we, we uh, are excited that this COVID actually opens up all kinds of opportunities that we may not have had prior when 
being stuck in the classroom was pretty much our own option since going on field trips has been getting harder and harder and harder over the decades. And so what we want to emphasize again as we finish this webinar on pedagogy of aloha is that ancient is modern. I can't emphasize that enough that if we follow the traditional ways of our kupuna that were captured in so many olelo no eau, we will exceed, not just reach, but exceed world standards. Um, in, nine, in 1824, King Liholiho, uh, the son of Kamehameha the Great, or Kamehameha II, uh, went to England um, to meet King George. And, um, the people in England were very, very surprised when they saw him. They had expected a savage, maybe a noble savage, because in 1824, every person of color was sort of looked at as a savage. And so they had expected a savage, you know, um, that was clearly below their status. And here was Liho Liho, you know, he was dressed to the T his hair perfect, eyebrows and all, as you can see. Um, he could speak some English. He knew how to dine with, with forks and spoons and drink out of a glass, etc., etc. Um, and the people in England were just so surprised to see him uh, be so debonair, to be so worldly. And so they asked him, you know, how can that be? You know, we thought you would be this savage, you know, um, that would, you know, be covering in a loincloth and, and unable to speak English and just clearly below our intellectual status. And Liho Liho looked at them and he's kind of, today he would have said, duh, but at that point, that time he said, Navai ho ika ole o ke akamai, he ala hele i maa i ka hele ia e o umau makua. Who would not be wise? on a path walked upon by my parents and my ancestors. And so he clearly recognized, yes, he could dress up, you know, in the finest Western clothing. He could communicate in a, in a, in a language other than English, if he, uh, other than Hawaiian Kalamai. He could, you know, eat the food the way the Westerners ate their food and, and et cetera, et cetera. But his confidence, his who he was, his identity, um, his value was really who he was based on who his parents and his grandparents were. So he didn't credit the Haole, um, you know, explorers and, and people that, that jumped ship in Hawaii that taught him how to eat or that taught him how to, how to dress, et cetera, et cetera. The Western food I'm saying with Western utensils. Um, but he credited his parents and his grandparents and his ancestors with who he was as an individual, as a world-class individual. And so if we as, as, as 21st century Hawaiians want to provide world-class education to our students, it needs to be based on the Ike of Aokupuna. And we should likely holiho we need to value those traditional ways, those traditional methods and ways of learning and of understanding and realize that for us, ancient is modern. And just that idea that our kupuna already knew then how to best educate um, in a way that aligns today with the latest, greatest in 21st century education, just shows again how infinite the knowledge of our kupuna was and is. Lehu lehu a mano mano ka ikena a Great and numerous is the knowledge of the Hawaiians. And that is what we need to remember as we design our curriculum for this next year as we look at how are we going to teach our students this upcoming school year, go back to the Ike of our kupuna. 
Mahalo Nui for sharing, Mama. How can people find out more about your pedagogy, your research methodology? So if you want a, a, power, a copy of the PowerPoint, you can contact me or uh, want to know more, please contact me. You can also um, go to our website, www.kuakanaka.com, and there's all kinds of resources, including articles there that we have written, um, and or just uh, email me or um, ask me um, or, or call me if you need more information or if you, if you need help. Uh, at your school or for yourself in terms of um, preparing for this upcoming school year. Um, Kua Kanaka is a social enterprise and we do provide professional development for educators, private and public schools of all ages. Mahalo Nui for joining us today. We would like to close with our gratitude chat. Mahalo a year. Mahalo e ie, mahalo e kale hulehu, mahalo e na makua, mahalo e na pupuna, mahalo e na alio hawaii, mahalo e na au makua, mahalo e na akua. Mahalo e ie. Mahalo. Mahalo e. Thank you again for joining us with the Kanayokana Talk. Aloha. Aloha.